Well, thank you very much uh, for the for the introduction. And actually, uh, Rich Sarandon stole my the first my opening couple of lines because I wanted to start off by saying very similar things. Uh, the Eclipse Foundation has been around. We will, it will be 20 years in January uh, that we've been around, and I've been the executive director of the Eclipse Foundation for its uh, for its entire life uh, so far. So, um, and I have learned a ton, and I have learned a ton from. Uh, you, you folks from the Apache Software Foundation, and uh, so I can't. I just really want to stress um, how um, pleased I was to get this invitation. Uh, it's humbling, and I really think that uh, that we have a lot of mutual respect between our two organizations, and I hope that comes through uh, in the talk that I'm about to give. Uh, to a large degree, um, my soon to be not subliminal message is: the world needs more Apache. Um, one of the things that uh, one of my one of the messages I wanted to give you folks here today is there's a lot of things that are happening outside the Apache Software Foundation and the world around us, and we need more of you. Um, you have an immense amount of wisdom and experience uh, in your in the Apache Software Foundation um, and in in your community, uh, and we need we need more engagement. Um, and so I, I hope that that, uh, that that comes through um, in, in the talk that I'm about to give. Now, <clears throat> uh, some, of, some of you who've been around for a while might have actually kind of twigged a little bit when you saw the, the title of my talk, right? Because 12 years ago, there was this blog post that was just raking Apache over the, over the coals um, because apparently Apache, uh, the only thing that it did was provide developer infrastructure. And Apache apparently just wasn't moving to Git fast enough. Um, but there's a line in this in the in the opening. And by the way, you can't even get this blog post anymore. I dug this out of a talk that I did in 2012 called uh, "Foundations Considered Useful." That kind of is a bit of an inspiration for this talk. Um, but there is a line in here that I think is 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 worth exploring a little bit, which is institutions will try to preserve the problem to which they are the solution. Now, this was meant totally like sarcasm at the time. It's like, well, you, all you guys do is infrastructure and you suck at that, so you should just go away. Um, and, um, you know, suffice it to say, that's not all that we do, and it's not all that, certainly not all that Apache does. Um, and here we are, um, 12 years later, um, um, standing tall and proud. So if we do more than just provide developers infrastructure, you know, what is it that we do uh, as, as open source foundations? And I think really there's three primary missions that every open source foundation provides. And, and, and certainly in the case of the Eclipse Foundation, uh, we share a lot of common values uh, with you folks in terms of openness and transparency, uh, vendor neutrality and so on. But I think job number one that of, of what we do for uh, in our foundations is preserve user freedom. And I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go, but preserving user freedom to use open source software is, is, is definitely job number one. And it's weird to say this in 2023, but this is no long, this is actually under attack. It's, it's there's more in subtle ways um, than just open source licenses to, to, to take away user freedom. And foundations are the ultimate guarantor of, of that. Protecting and empowering developers is another key mission, um, and it's something that we all share. And, and then finally, enabling collaboration. I mean, the collaboration that we all enable, we have different governance rules, um, but, but we share these, these common values. But ultimately, the ability to bring people um, and companies and institutions together on a level playing field to build great software is a huge part of, of why we exist. And it bears repeating, open source is, was started and is ultimately about preserving um, user freedom. And so that's job number one. Everything that we do at the Cups Foundation, we really think through this lens. Is how is this going to make sure that the software that our projects produce is going to be available to everybody for as long as people find it useful? But we also create a level playing field that is the level playing field that's necessary for collaboration. Um, so really, when you think about the bottom layer, Apache, Eclipse, you know, all of them, we provide a governance layer. 
the set of legal documents, the board um, structure, um, the project structure, the PMC structure, all of this is about providing governance for projects and communities. And you know, you saw from the tracks earlier that Rich was showing, it's like we are, all of these foundations, these large ones have become communities of communities. But taking that governance model that we've developed uh, over time and applying it to multiple different scenarios is, is part of our power. And then that enables collaboration in the projects. Um, and that's where the, you know, where the rubber hits the road, where developers really get to build cool things and ultimately deliver technology that's useful. And that useful technology is about creating markets and ecosystems and products that then companies <coughs> compete with in the marketplace and, and, and make money on. Um, and that's what provides this virtuous cycle where then there can be investment back into our projects. So when we talk at the Eclipse Foundation, at least, and I think this is a pretty general purpose, I think it applies elsewhere, when we talk about this governance platform, collaboration platform, the services that we provide um, at the Eclipse Foundation are, you know, this infrastructure for open collaboration, and yeah, we use GitHub, we also have our own instance of GitLab, and we're in the process of gradually winding down our old C, Git, Garrett, Bugzilla, Forge, you know, thank God when we drive a wooden stake through that, the heart of that thing, but people still love it and use it, so it takes, these things take time. But yeah, I mean, infrastructure is important, um, and it's in providing, it's part of providing that level playing field. Ecosystem development, that's what we call it. You probably call it, you know, finding sponsors. Right. Um, Community governance and processes we've already talked about. And then finally, I mean, Apache's famous for it, Eclipse is famous for it. You know, IP management and licensing, making sure that our projects can be consumed, that's actually part of preserving user freedom in a different way. Uh, in making sure that when users get technology from an institution like Apache or Eclipse, they feel comfortable in being able to use it. So each open source foundation has a unique set of core competencies that really come around a rich culture of community wisdom. And I think Apache is, that's one of the things you're most famous for. I mean, the name of this conference really speaks to that, right? Community over code. But the collective wisdom that's in your community and the rich culture that comes from that is, is definitely one of the most important aspects of being, of being the Apache Software Foundation. Proven project governance frameworks um, that delivers great technology time and time and time again, and in ways that make it, these projects more sustainable over time, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then we all have track records of thriving developer communities with audiences in the millions. Um, you know, you folks have your, your project successes, we have our project successes. Um, I'm not going to talk about NetBeans versus Eclipse IDE because just because that's been that's really old. Um, but it's it's you know we all we have our various track records, but we have experience in being able to do this in a repeatable way. So these are what foundations do, but the world is always changing around us, and there's four different things that I really want to call out as things that not only um, are challenges to the open source community and, and foundations, but opportunities um, for us to grow and thrive um, and continue to, um, to continue to solve problems um, in ways that are relevant to our, to our stakeholders. So, and we're going through all of these user freedoms. Um, it, it's, again, it's, it's amazing to me that in 2023, this is still kind of a debate. Uh, we're even still a thing, but it is. Uh, sustainability of projects is a challenge. Security is, is ever increasing, um, an ever increasing issue. And then finally, um, congratulations, ladies and gentlemen, governments have finally noticed that open source is important. <laughs> Oops. Oh um, <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, yeah, and uh, when somebody says, hi, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help you. Uh, anyways, um, so talking about user freedoms, it's, so this HashiCorp is the most recent one, so I'm going to pick on them a little bit, but I mean, MongoDB and on and on and on, like any single time somebody goes, oh yeah, well the OSI's definition of open source, that's not really the definition of open source, and we can call it whatever we want, like, okay, frankly, they have an agenda, they're full of shit, run away. Um, and, you know, guys like Matt Assay writing um, blog, you know, editorials that say, you know, developers don't care about licensing. Well, if developers don't care about licensing, 
why did all those companies and developers um, put together open tofu as, as fast as they did right i mean it's developers actually do care about licensors but the companies and the companies that developers work for care about licenses but i think what we've really learned um, is that user freedom, really protecting user freedom, is about more than just the software license. Yes, under the Apache software license or any of the open source licenses, you can fork a project and carry on under, under a different name and away you go. But the roles that the foundations provide um, in owning the trademarks with a non-profit stewardship, making sure that these, these projects have a vendor-neutral, diverse investment in them so that they are resilient, doing the IP management so that companies know when they're consuming the technology that, that it's not being controlled or captured by any single particular vendor. These are all elements of preserving user freedom, and foundations are the best way to do this. Um, there's really nothing else, uh, there's been no other solution that compares to the success that foundations provide in guaranteeing user freedoms above and beyond what's in the licenses. And that's true of Apache, it's true of Eclipse, it's true of all of them. Um, and I think this is really something that we should emphasize more um, when we're talking to, uh, to out there about what we do as foundations. Is it's not about, um, you know, the other things, but user freedom and preserving user freedom is a huge, should be a huge part of technology adoption choices. Right? If you're adopting a project that, that, is, that is an open source project from a single vendor that has a CLA that assigns all the copyrights to that single vendor, guess what's going to happen eventually? Right? I mean, sooner or later the VCs are going to go, remember when we said we wanted 10x out of this thing? Well, we actually meant we want 10x out of this thing, so giddy up. Um, and open source foundations are the best way to protect that. Sustainability. Every single person in this in this room has seen this comment, right? And so, you know, it's all about the guy in Nebraska, yada, yada, yada. Um, I have bad news. This picture is wildly optimistic. Um, so if you look at, this is, uh, by the way, if you haven't, if you haven't listened to these guys, uh, this is the, the open source security podcast guys, uh, both ex-Red Hat guys. Uh, they do some blogging on the side where I pick this up. So they've done this, they've crunched these numbers. This is NPM. Uh, they say they've done the same thing with, with Linux packages. But basically, what this is showing is that the number of maintainers working on the vast majority of NPM dependencies is asymptotically close to one. All right, now, I know everybody in the room is going, oh, well, of course it is. It's like there's millions of those things, they're all crap, who cares? All right. Let's zero in on the top 5% of all NPM dependencies. And did you notice how much that graph changed? All right, so the top 5% of all NPM dependencies are, once you get past, uh, once you get below 500,000, you hit um, three um, on, on average. Um, so sustainability um, is a huge problem in open source. And, what, and my hypothesis is foundations play a huge role in, in the sustainability of open source projects. You know, I think one of the ways to describe it is, you know, it takes a village to raise a project. Um, it's, and the reason, so the reason why foundations help with the sustainability of projects is you're not alone. Right? When you're the one person on GitHub that's maintaining an NPM dependency and all of a sudden it, gets, it becomes important. That's one of my other favorite lines is, is that, you know, open source is all fun and games until people really like your project. Right? Um, you know, once, once your project really takes off, uh, having the community support, the foundation support, the governance models that we have all learned through 20 plus years of experience um, all start to really come into play. And there's been lots of instances at Eclipse, and I'm sure the same is true of Apache, where projects start to flounder, and the community digs in and comes to help. We find additional resources, um, we, and, and we get the project back up on its feet. Um, and then finally, there's even managed end of life. Projects have an end of life. Um, and having a process other than just you know walking away um, and saying, I'm done, 
um, is, is absolutely critical, not only for making the, ultimately the sustainability of the project or the end of life of the project, but also, again, for protecting the users that are consuming that project. Security. Um, so just a couple of slides here to try to give you kind of perspective on how big a problem security is. So cybercrime would be the world's third largest economy if it wasn't economy. So number one, US, number two, China, number three, cybercrime. We're talking projected damages of $10.5 trillion by 2025. So that's the competition, that's the red team. Right? They have that amount of money to invest in circumventing whatever it is that we try to do um, on the blue team to, um, to protect our projects and protect the security of the people that are using our technologies. <clears throat> and between 2020 and 2022, we saw a 742% increase um, in supply chain attacks in particular. Um, and so that's... I mean, that's the scale of the challenge that we all face um, on security. Um, and when we talk about supply chain threats, where are the threats? Well, the bad news is the threats are pretty much everywhere. Every time, you know, every, every different uh, transition through from source code through to build out and, and sign binaries in the hands of the consumer, and then it's turtles all the way down the dependency chain. You're, you're, you're only as strong as your weakest link in your supply chain, right? So this is um, this is a this is a horrendous problem, and we are not collectively as an industry, and I mean I don't just mean the open source community, but the software industry as a whole. This is going to be a multi-year, multi-layer process to try to um, to do better than we are today. Um, and I think, from the Eclipse Foundation perspective, I can tell you what we're, what we're trying to do. Um, and it, this is imperfect, and I, I'm gonna have to stress, this is gonna be a multi-year journey. Um, it's not going to be, um, uh, you know, snap your fingers and all of a sudden, whoops, we're secure. Because uh, that's just not how it works. But we are, uh, a year and a half ago, we had zero dedicated headcount at the Eclipse Foundation um, working on security. And now we have five and a half. Um, and we're planning on hopefully growing that, continuing to grow that team. And so we're actually, when we talked earlier about this, you know, four core services that we think a foundation provide, supply chain security for us is becoming a fifth in the sense that we don't think that, uh, and you go back to power and empowering um, and protecting developers, uh, developers your average developer, not, this is not universally true, but your average developer doesn't want to do, have anything to do with security. Um, they want to write their code and they want to focus on the problem that they're solving. Supply chain security is really to a large degree about the processes around the project and the code that's being developed in order to protect it and, and, uh, and, and to make sure that the infrastructure is hardened. Now, Secure by design is a whole other different kettle of fish, and yeah, training and so on is definitely part of, of, of doing that. But we actually think that supply chain security needs to be a core service uh, of foundations going forward, forward. Because again, our promise ultimately to our users is that you can use our technology in a safe way. You know, 10 years ago, that was mostly about intellectual property management and copyright provenance and maybe even it's a little bit of patent licensing and so on, but that is now changing to include security. So we think foundations have a particular role to play um, in supply chain security, be above and beyond the, the kinds of scans and tools and so on that we're all gonna be getting from, from GitHub. I mean, that, these, are, these are important, but in addition and above and beyond that, there's, infra there's additional infrastructure support um, you know, I got a UB key now, it's just like everybody is, uh, you know, two-factor authentication and all that kind of stuff is, is definitely part of the future. Um, putting in staff resources to help protect um, developers from having to carry all the weight of doing security for their projects. Um, paying for security audits, training, reporting and tracking. These are all things that, that foundations can help their communities with in terms of doing supply chain security. All right, let's talk about regulation. Um, and I just wanna have a couple of slides to kind of motivate what's going on here. So, first thing is, 
We all have to recognize that we live in a world that is owned and operated by software. Right? Everything that we do in our societies, in our economies, in our personal lives is enabled and controlled by software. Um, and open source software, depending on which part of, you know, which, which study you read, is anywhere from 70 to 95 percent of the software that's running our lives. Uh, depending on your different niches and, and so on and so forth. But open source software is a fundamentally critical part of the broader technology and software industry that is, that is running our lives. So I can remember a couple of years ago we used to say, ah, open source won. Well, be careful what you ask for. Um, because with great power comes great responsibility. And I think that that's one of the things that we all have to grapple with, is that um, the, the days where you know, there were no consequences for what we did in our projects, I think is coming to a close, at least for the important ones. Um, and that being that a lot of part of the reason why that's happening, and I know this is a, don't want to hurt anybody's feelings here, but the log for shell thing was a pivotal moment. This was similar to, was it 1962 when Ralph Nader published his book, Unsafe at Any Speed. It was the moment that governments woke up and went, shit, we have a problem. And it wasn't because there's, you know, you guys, I'm sure there's some, I hope there's somebody in the room that's involved this fantastic job. You did, you know, did all you could do. I don't want to apply that blog for is unsafe at any speed. That's not what I'm saying. It's just that. When they started looking for where this was, it was everywhere, right? And so government regulators came to the realization that open source was absolutely ubiquitous. And it was something that they didn't understand and they needed to start figuring out. Um, now, and so industry regulation is coming our way. Um, whether you're talking um, in, in, in the US or in Europe, um, but it's really important for us to understand that from the point of view of governments, this is not about regulating open source. This is about regulating software. Well, you know, 80%, 90% of software is open source, so guess what? Collateral damage, right? There is going to be, there are going to be implications um, for regulation that, that are going to impact, impact all of us. And the good news is in the US, um, they've hired some people, they've built this CISA group um, agency that are really um, thinking carefully about how to do this in a way that protects and preserves um, the open source community. Unfortunately, in Europe, not so much. Um, and I mean, I, I do entire talks on the Cyber Resilience Act. If you, if you anybody who wants to, to, to look me up, there's, uh, there's stuff on YouTube and, and, uh, and I've got a couple of blog posts and so on. Um, there's, there's like so many, um, so many things wrong with this in its current state, but amongst the things is, one, they think that if you pass a regulation, poof, things will get better. Um, two, and this is hard to, it's hard for me to say out loud, they think that every software developer should be a security expert. Three, they think that every single piece of software must be secure by design at all times. Um, so that's the mental viewpoint that they're starting from when they, when they drafted the regulation. Um, and so us and a bunch of others are doing everything we can to, to, uh, change, to, to change the regulation before it becomes law. Um, but this is, this, is, this is a huge potential issue um, for, um, for uh, the, entire software, uh, the entire software industry, but open source in particular. So we at the Coop Foundation, at least, have come to the realization that we need to add public policy as a sixth core service, um, and we are in the process of doing that. We now have one and a half full-time people on staff whose job it is is to worry about public policy, um, both on the U.S. and, and on the Europe, European side. Um, but I think uh, foundations have a, have a real role in, in uh, representing our communities in policy making, and this is one of the areas that I would really wish to see more Apache. We, we could use more Apache um, in, in helping shape these policies on both sides of the Atlantic. Because Apache, Eclipse, Linux, these, these institutions are looked at as trusted resources by policymakers. They actually are interested in listening to what we have to say. 
Um, we are also, as foundations, um, stewards of our communities, and we can help mobilize our communities um, to, 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 uh, to perhaps shape the effect of, uh, of legislation on both sides. And to the degree possible, I know that's a little bit different at the, uh, at the Apache, but at Eclipse, we're finding ways, it's not easy, but we are finding ways to fund staff um, to, to really help us shape our positions um, and provide useful input to the policy-making process. But in the end, um, regulation is coming. Um, even in the U.S., that's, 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 you know, so far it looks like they're doing a much better job of shaping their, their regulation than in Europe. It is coming. So things are going to change. The, the technology industry it, uh, has never been regulated in its history, except for you know, specific areas like healthcare and, and so on. Um, all of software is going to become, at some level, a regulated industry, which is very, very different from the, from the you know, status quo. And foundations are, I think, in a perfect position to help our communities deal with that by providing staff resources, um, the policies and procedures, you know, the Apache way and, and how you guys go about producing software um, to a large degree, and, and your, your, your security handling today to a large degree meets the requirements, um, uh, or many of the requirements that are going to be in these regulations. But there's going to have to be legal entities that are going to say, yes, we comply with this regulation, and yes, we will take the liability, and yes, we will buy the errors and emissions insurance policy to help cover our projects and communities um, in order to protect them um, if, if something goes wrong. And I think that's, that's a new and, you know, this, this, I would have never even thought of a slide that looked like this a year ago. Um, this is, this is, something that is that is new and I can, and I can tell you like the CRA um, the Cyber Resilience Act in Europe if you get it wrong if you put a CE mark on a product that should not have a CE mark on it um, that's potentially a 15 million euro fine um, actually if you if you fix a CE if you knowingly affix a CE mark fraudulently on a product that's a criminal offense um, so these are these are not small decisions, and these are these are definitely areas where uh, foundations can help uh, protect and empower our developers and our projects. So, just to recap, some of the challenges that we uh, that we're looking at is preserves preservation of user freedom, sustainability of our projects, and, and making our developers' lives easier with sustainability. Grappling with the issues of security. Um, and dealing with the fact that we are moving to a regulated industry for the first time um, in, in, history, in the history of software. These are big challenges to the open source community as a whole and ones that I believe foundations like ours are particularly well positioned um, to play a role in, in, in protecting user freedoms and empowering developers um, and enabling collaboration, which is you know, institutions will try to preserve the problem to which they are the solution while, you know, preserving user freedoms and empowering developers and enabling collaboration. If that's, if those are the problems that we are trying to preserve, sign me up. Thank you very much. I've been super impressed with how proactive Eclipse is in this sort of long-term thinking. And I hope that this is a call to action for us because this is something that we're traditionally not great at. We are on autopilot on a lot of things, and you know, we've always we've always taken security seriously, but what that means is that Mark works hard. And uh, recently we've been looking at, at public policy, but that is a very, very new thing. And I hope that this is an opportunity for you to step up to help do this work. Um, we, uh, it, one of the, the great benefits of this conference is that you, many of you, have for the first time really realized that you're part of something bigger than just your software project. And that's, that's what this event did for me 25 years ago. And uh, I hope that that is happening to you as well. But I, I really would like to, to know if anybody has any questions for Mike, because I, I think that he is a powerful voice in our industry. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, 
for the people that don't know me, I am Federico Gonzalez. I'm actually the, I am a policymaker. So when you talk about governments being out of it, I always like to put up the hand and say that I belong, I'm the actual CEO of the National Research and Innovation Center of Mexico. So we've been regulating towards um, benefiting from open source communities and actually taking that into our government services, and that's why I'm here. I'm going to be giving a talk later on today about how we're using actual open source banking core for the Mexican government. Um, but that's just something so you can know that there is a country somewhere here in the Americas that is doing something about that. Um, you mentioned in one of your slides to include insurance. What type of insurance are you actually like talking about there? Because I know that you can take that liability so in case you screw up with the 15 million stuff. So um, there's a couple of different, so we carry, at Eclipse Foundation, we carry three different insurance policies. And I'm sure what you, you, you have to carry at least one of these, which is director's and officer's insurance. Um, I'm sure you're doing that. We do. Then there's a general liability insurance. We actually have employees, so even things like, you know, something an employee drives a, car, a rental car through a storefront window or something, you, you need general liability. But the third one is errors and emissions. Um, and that's, um, that can help cover situations where, um, you know, there's a, there's a bug in a piece of software. We've never actually had to use it. Um, but that's, that is one of the things that, um, that, that, that we carry on behalf of our projects. Um, and ultimately, it's, it's about um, the way our IP flows work is really different than Apache. Um, so, but I mean, ultimately, the projects that we ship from the Eclipse Foundation, uh, it, to, in a lot of cases, to a consumer, looks like a product of the Eclipse Foundation. Um, even if they're under the Eclipse Big license or, I mean, we actually use multiple licenses, so it could be under Apache as well. Um, but if it looks like a product um, to a consumer and there's a problem, then there's always the possibility of, of, um, of needing to uh, have some money to, to, to protect yourselves and the projects. Thank you. Just to follow up, you're, you're indicating that that might grow, uh, your insurance policy might grow over time right, right now with all this. Uh, yeah, so... Um, errors and emissions, um, obviously, if in a world where like, there's, there's a multiple potential future parallel universes, depending on how the CRA actually shows up in the end, um, but, you know, if the version that came out of uh, the parliament was to be passed into law, then we would have to, uh, and, and have to remember, the Eclipse Foundation is now a European organization, right? I mean, on the front line, you know, Eclipse Foundation, AISBL, we're now headquartered in Brussels. Um, and so, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be part of this no matter what. We're, like, we are, you know that old joke about the difference between involvement and commitment, right? You know, it's like you sit down for breakfast, the, the chicken was involved, but the pig is committed. Right, so the Eclipse Foundation is committed to um, to coming out with it, it, to supporting whatever the CRA comes out with. But if we have to affix a CE mark to every single pro, um, project release um, and do all the documentation and all of the um, and undertake all of the obligations of of doing that uh, for every single um, product release, then yeah, the, the the opportunity for errors goes up by probably an order of magnitude. Um, and by the way, I talked about the CRA, there's a whole other thing called the Product Liability Directive, um, which, again, depending on which version gets passed, the Product Liability Directive would basically take the disclaimers of warranty and the limitations of liability um, in all of our open source licenses and basically put a big red X through them. They would be, they would be, they would be meaningless um, because one of the things that um, developers often don't understand is you cannot license away the law. So if the law says you cannot limit liability and you cannot disclaim warranties, it doesn't matter if it's in your license. The law wins. Um, so in that case, then, yeah, that's that's uh, that would be even a, a bigger issue. And actually, and, and on top of all of that. Right? Uh, at least us at the, we at the Coast Foundation, and I don't know if this is happening at Apache or not, but we're starting to get projects that are interested in getting um, safety certifications, like ISO 26262 and, and the like. And so, 
Um, that's a whole other uh, kettle of fish when you start uh, shipping software that can be used in a car, used in a medical device, and the likes. Um, that's a whole other um, a whole other kettle of fish. Uh, thanks, Mike, for coming along and showing this. Uh, I mentioned it, trademarks twice. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so it's kind of a two-part question. One is the the CRA and the PLD, both, of course, big things. Um, there's even with somewhat learned people I've been talking with, some people are like, this could make us personally liable for every Apache project that has made a release that we've committed code to personally. And some people are like, this is going to be a big nothing burger. We'll sort of figure stuff out. How can we get better information for the average developer? Like, what is this likely to mean? And is there any way that somebody who's not in the open forum Europe can really understand what's going to actually come out of their entire log and whatnot? Uh, so, um, no, no, and, but don't panic. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, okay, so uh, let me explain that. So, uh, where this legislation is currently, the Europeans have a very interesting um, process. Um, so, it, every law is, is drafted by the Commission, and then it goes through your Parliament committees, and in parallel, there's this thing called the Council of the European Union, which is represented by um, uh, diplomats that represent each of the 27 member states of the uh, of the uh, of the Union. And so, and they call these three bodies the co-legislators. And at this step in the process, it's already gone through the Council. It's already gone through the the, uh, the Parliament's committees. It's been drafted by the Commission. So now they're in what they call the trilogue which is a behind-closed-doors conversation where they negotiate the final text. And none of us, unless there's a leak, none of us actually know what the final form of the CRA is going to be until it's published in the European Gazette in January or February. So, yeah, so we can read tea leaves and we're, we have a policy person in Brussels now that's going to every meeting and talking to every single person to try to get a feeling for, and we're, and with Open Forum Europe and others, we're trying to nudge things in the right direction, but ultimately, we're not gonna know what the final version of this is until um, Q1 next year. Um, but don't panic. Uh, at an absolute minimum, from the day that it's published in the European Gazette, uh, we have two, a minimum, and there, this is another thing that's under negotiation, somewhere between two and four years to actually implement it. Um, now, two to four years, uh, two, let's say two years, two years might sound like a long time, um, but on the list of things to do um, before we can implement the CRA is Europe has to develop a harmonized European standard for secure software development because that harmonized standard is, conforming to that harmonized standard is how you get the presumption that you've actually um, implemented the CRA properly. And that standard doesn't exist. Um, and anybody who's been involved in you know, software process standards, um, two years is an incredibly short time to, uh, to, to, to develop that. And on top of all that, then, um, I, and I don't want to rattle on the CRA too hard, but there's, um, there are, are some types of products like operating systems, user authentication systems, um, and the like, which are considered um, highly critical products that require the, uh, an external auditor um, to come in and get it and audit that you conform to the to the, to the, the, the non-existent European harmonized regulation. Um, so they're gonna have to recruit and train probably you know hundreds if not thousands of these auditors um, bef before the thing can really go live. So it's it's uh, yeah. So anyways, the, the, so. A little bit under control, behind closed doors, don't really know, trying hard, but don't panic. And we'll have plenty of time to sort of communicate exactly what this is and how our various communities are going to deal with it once it actually, once we actually see the final text. Hi, my name is Kanjana. There are uh, corporate and uh, tech companies who are hosting open source program offices and the Office of Open Source, uh, uh, that type of uh, organization. 
So with, within that, there are large projects, there are large products, or developer run, uh, developer develops uh, fun projects and makes exposed to the public. As you see, uh, what is which level and what would be the predictable impact uh, for such communities? They are hosting in different open source preventing platforms. Sorry, you mean the impact of the CRA in particular? Yes. Um, so there is a carve out in the CRA for the hobbyists and charities. So if you're a computer science student and you're doing your homework on GitHub, you're fine. Um, uh, but the way that they define, so there's, a, um, there's a phrase that they use in the legislation called commercial activity. Um, and we all, and every, a lot of people went, oh, commercial activity, well, open source isn't commercial, so we're good. And uh, so commercial activity does not mean what you think it means. Um, so because, uh, and they actually elaborated on this in, in, the, in, the, committee, in the committee report, it basically, um, if the project is being worked on by anybody who has a job, it's deemed to be commercial. Um, so, which, I think, I think that's everybody, right? I hope. Right? So, yeah, so they, they really mean, um, they, they really mean, you know, pretty much every single open source project that matters. Um, and they, and they haven't prevailed yet, so you know, there's, there's still a chance that, that, that this can work, all work out fine in the end. Because the council version was actually pretty good. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the parliament version that's particularly scary. But, I mean, and by the way, I, when, I, when I'm talking with it, like I sat down for two and a half hours with the people who wrote the CRA. So this isn't sort of like secondhand knowledge. I mean, I've looked them in the eyes and they said, yeah, that's what we mean. Um, so... Um, so anyways, yeah, so the answer to your question is at least one version of the CRA is basically any open source project that you've ever used or ever thought was useful or important is covered. Hi, I'm Craig Russell. I'm a, a, a member of the ASF. Um, I'm curious, based on what you know and what you can predict the CRA is going to look like, will there be any need to change any of the open source licenses, either the end user licenses or the contributor licenses? Um, I don't think so. Um, so, so the question is, do, we, do, we, do, do, do I think we need to change any licenses? And I don't think we do because, but it's more the PLD than the CRA. Um, uh, if they pass a law that says you cannot disclaim liability or warranty, then whatever you put in the license doesn't really matter. Uh, that's one side. But there's another side too, which is there is a hypothetical future universe where um, open source projects do something like, you know what, I'm not gonna do the CE mark on my project, and therefore I'm not making it available in Europe, and Europe, you can go pound sand, you can't use my project in Europe. You don't need to change the open source licenses to do that either. Um, I've actually had a few people argue with me on this point, but I'm pretty sure I'm right, um, in that people have said, well, if you can't put a geographic boundary on, uh, on a license, on an open source license. Um, but we do all the time, they're called export controls. Um, it's orthogonal to the license. There's, again, you can't license away the law. So if the law says you cannot make a, an open source project available in Europe unless you put the CE mark on it, a perfectly rational response for an open source developer would be, okay, then you can't use it in Europe. Um, and you don't think you have to change the licenses to do that. One more question. This is fun. <laughs> Hi, Mike. Um, I'm Hervé. I'm French. Um, I'm an Apache Software Foundation member, but I'm French. So I'm, I, I'm a EU citizen. I don't panic. But for me, <laughs> that, does it have a different meaning as a EU, a EU citizen? Because the power of the government is bigger for a EU citizen than from a US citizen point of view. Does it have any any meaning, any impact, what can I do? 
because of, as a, in our mindset, what can I do? Um, well, the first thing you can do is, um, and it's probably a little late in the day, but make sure that um, you communicate, it's a you know, political process, make sure you communicate to your members of the European Parliament that this is a, this is a bad choice. Um, I mean, you are an EU citizen, you get a vote. Um, your eyes, there are EU elections coming up, um, and having um, having um, this become a a uh, and it's 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 unlikely because as, as important as we know we know we are to innovation and the economy and so on, um, like the popular press, like when the when the popular press writes about the cyber resilience act, open source does is not on the list of issues. Like when you talk about like Politico or Euroactive or these sort of the, the sort of publications that that follow government policy shortly, none of these concerns that we're talking about even make the list of things that they that they mention. Um, but ultimately, as a European citizen, um, you, you're in a you're you're you can still work on a on an Apache project that's hosted in the U.S. But it might be possible that your your colleagues and peers in Europe might not be able to use that project, um, depending on what patch, you know, what position Apache takes on on CRA conformance. And, 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 and also the final form of the CRA. I want to stress, like there's multiple versions of this thing floating around. This is not doom and this is not entirely doom and gloom. There are some reasons for cautious optimism that reason will prevail. Um, it's we're kind of talking about the worst case scenario. All right, well, thank you so much. Again, this has been an honor and privilege. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.